Hey there, honey bunnies. Welcome to episode 87, What to Do When It All Falls Away. That's the temporary title anyway. Um, what I wanted to share with you today is, I don't know, I have never done an interview on this podcast. It, it hasn't been the purpose of that. I've been asked several times. But it's not, um, the purpose of this podcast is... I'm a projector in human design, and when I feel the energy, that's when I work, and when I don't feel the energy, I don't work. The podcast is a place for me to work. (laughs) Work in the sense of not trying to get clients or build a business or do anything in particular other than what I consider my ultimate work, which is to put out whatever's coming through, and then I don't care after that. Like, there's um, in the Bhagavad Gita, I believe, I'm probably messing that up, but there's um, an ancient saying that your work is to put the work out in the world, and that's the end of it. What happens to it after that? is really not your business. You can have hopes for it. You can have wishes and even goals for it. But at the end of the end of the day, what happens to your work is in the eye of the beholder, in the arm, in the hands of the consumer. Um, Our work, even when we think it's real clear and real obvious what we do, is still being consumed through the filter of others. I can say something, be very clear on what I think I'm saying, but if I say that to a group of people, each person in that group will have their own spin on it. I discovered this very uncomfortable (laughs) human thing when I was um, first becoming a supervisor because I would have... I would be uh, leading staff meetings and um, talking to staff and giving them direction and direction and directives and having conversations and then um, stating expectations and we would leave and I would it would start coming back to me or I would get questions or they would start doing things and they would not at all be what I said. Some people heard what I thought I was saying. Some people heard something completely different, right? And our attention span is like that of a, a, a goldfish, if we're lucky, because of social media. So this is what the podcast is. So I don't do interviews, but I'm, I'm going to ask the woman I, who's a very, very good sister friend to me, um, if she will participate in a conversation for us because um, it's a a funny thing we discovered today that we're both going through the exact same thing at the exact same time, which hasn't ever happened before. Um, I'm older than her and we've had some similar but uh, different life experiences. So um, we've never gone through the same thing at the same time, but that's happening now. And I believe that you know, we're doing it. Obviously, other people are doing it too. That's part of what I um, do with this podcast also, is share my experiences with you in the hopes that you know that you're not alone. And whatever dumb thing you think you've done that's unforgivable, somebody has done in the world and written a book about it and is now making money money off their stupid ass mistake while you're sitting around feeling shame about it. So, (laughs) you know, um, uh, I share my mistakes with you. I share my opinions with you, sometimes rambly and definitively and strong and, you know, whatever. Once I I load the podcast, I'm done with it, or the episode, I'm done with it. I hope that you have a space for yourself in your world where you let yourself be unfiltered, where you let yourself produce content, and you just don't give a fuck where it goes after that. There's an enormous freedom in that. The beauty about a podcast episode is I can't tell who downloads it. 
who likes it, who doesn't like it. None of that data is there. I mean, I can see numbers of downloads and where they were downloaded. Um, but there's no, um, there's no data stream that can hook your ego in about, oh, this one got so many likes. And oh, nobody liked that one. You know, it looks like none of that. So there's a, it's a, just a, a nice free place to hang out. Make your own podcast. It's super easy, too. So um, that wasn't the point of this. <laughs> in the conversation today and conversations I've seen going around in the other groups, a couple of things are happening. Time is bizarre. Bizarro world. Up is down. Down is up. Left is right. Right is left. Everything is spinning. Everything is strange. Uh, We don't have a good internal sense of, I think it's been about an hour. I should take a break, you know. Some people can't hold their, their attention for five minutes. Some people are holding their attention for three hours on something, which is way too long for the body. Um, everything is just squishy and weird. So the image I have is of a fun house mirror. You know, if you ever went to a carnival and you went into the fun house mirror section, (laughs) you go walk past these ripply mirrors or you stand in front of these mirrors that make your body and everything around you look extremely extremely distorted and if you move you know the image is all swimmy and strange um and it does have a a feel of like distortion and like sound is weird image everything is just fucking weird and it's disorienting and it's hard to find a place to stand i posted a poem on my social media feeds, Instagram and Facebook, um, about that. Like, where do I stand? And in the poem, I meant that in several different ways. Where do I stand on social justice issues? If you miss that rant and rave, go back and listen to Podcast 86, where get loud in your business, because I kind of went off on a ranty thing. But where do I stand in that? Where do I st- what is my role in social justice? What is my role as someone who has a bit of a following? What do what you know, where do I stand? But it was also where do I stand now in my identity? Where do I stand in this forest that's constantly trying to devour my home? <laughs> Anything that is still longer than two weeks has, uh, I'm not joking, literally honeysuckle vine, raspberry cane, um, starts just wrapping itself around. If you let something sit for six months, you might not be able to find it again. And I promise you that's true because there was an old lawnmower and I was like, okay, I need to get someone to come out and gather up all this stuff so it doesn't look like a freaking junkyard. And I was like, oh my God, where's that mower? It's gone. Like I had to go look and it's already buried just in six months. Where do I stand in that? Where do I stand as a woman in her, you know, uh, menopause ish? Where do I stand as an ap- approaching the idea of being an elder or a leader, all that stuff is changing. And I know I'm not the only one experiencing that. So when I was talking to um, her today, we were talking about, and oh, and then in human design, the shift is from going from earning your money by working your fingers to the bone to attracting and earning your money through taking exquisite care of yourself, um, making sure that you are healthy and well-fed and well-rested and well-sexed and well-loved and (laughs) well-dressed, whatever that means to you. You know, we're going from a, a construct of work, work, linear, linear, follow this linear path, disregard your body and you'll make money to 
body has to come first. The food, the quality of your relationships have to come first. And that determines your income earning ability. Um, I'm just going to use her name because I'm pretty sure she won't care. So it's Heather Westmoreland, who I've recommended to you guys before. She's a, a medium that does body healing work with her mediumship. So it's not your typical... Let's call up Grandpa on the dead lady phone and see how he's doing. It's like, no, let's let's invite Grandpa f- into a conversation that impacts us physically and provides healing and stuff like that. So I think her website is just heatherwestmoreland.com. I can't remember. You can find her if you go look at my friends list. I think her Facebook page is Medium Heather Westmoreland. Um, anyway... We were talking about this shifting polarity of reaching outward, which is projectors cannot do, manifesting generators, generators, reflectors. We can't reach outside ourselves to try and bring things in. Um, This is... We have to reverse that. We have to wait for something to respond to. We have to wait for the invitation. We have to wait 28 days. You have to magnetize your body, which means you've got to be aware of your body, which means you have to slow down and listen and have a daily practice and shift from reaching out of yourself to settling back into your hip bones and magnetizing to you. So not getting, not going out to grab or get anything at all. And not doing this resting like, okay, I'm going to rest and connect to my body and that's going to bring me money. No. The money is a side effect. Okay, there are a couple of podcasts back. It's some, I can't remember the title, something about power and money is a side effect of you owning your power. Taking your focus off money and getting clients and putting your focus on your well-being. How highly do you think of yourself? How well are you taking care of yourself? If you're allowing yourself to scroll on the internet until your eyeballs burn, that's not self-care. That's not respectful of your body. Sitting at the computer with no pee breaks and no snacks and no water, that's not respectful of your body. It's shifting that. Respect your body. Feel the power in it. Reconnect to your home and your land and your physical container. And then the money comes. The people come. The ideas come. The inspiration comes. Um, You don't have to go get it. You don't even have to wonder how it's going to come. You can completely let go of the how and things just start coming. So it's not a passive process. It's not like I'm going to lay on the couch and eat, you know, watermelon all day or whatever you're into. I've been very into watermelon lately, but it's not that it's. It's this understanding and ownership and claiming of your powerfulness related to partnership with your body, not your mind, not your intelligence, your analysis abilities, your your intellect, none of that. It's partnership with your body, which naturally reverses the polarity of pushing away and activates the polarity of receiving, of magnetism. So there's a, a, a thing out there about pulling stuff to you. I absolutely disagree with that as a technique, and it's not a judgment on people who use it, but I find it repulsive in my system. It feels very repulsive to me. Um, so this isn't that. This isn't like pulling stuff to you. Uh, It isn't connecting to other people's energy and pulling anything in. That's active, right? It sounds like that would be the same, but it's not. It's still reaching out to connect and then pull. So it'd be like throwing a rope out and then pulling in whatever happens to grab the rope. 
So it's not that. It is a side effect. It's a natural outcome. It's natural consequences, natural law. We seek joy. We're, we notice people who are laughing and having fun. If you're not comfortable with laughing and having fun, you notice and get irritated by that. <laughs> or loud kids or kids playing can irritate you if you're not comfortable with it. But we naturally notice things that are sparkly and lit up and, and enjoying themselves. And Okay, so the money, the inspiration, the ideas, the information that you need just come to you. You're not pulling them in. They just are a side effect. So that also contributes to a weird perception of time because we're dropping the linear creation mode of steps one, two, three, four, five, six. Steps A, B, C, D, E, F. Whoops. Oh my. I don't really know how to turn that Voxer thing off and still still record here. Okay, apologies if you guys hear the the um the uh, whatever. The notices, the Voxer ding dongs. Bing bongs. Um it contributes to the that distortion of time, I think. We we're letting go of this goes to that, goes to that, goes to that, and boom, you get your goal to you have an inspiration and you explore it with your strategy and authority. And if your body says, yes, go for it, you take a step toward it. Then some more information comes and maybe you turn left, maybe you turn right. Maybe you do take another step in a linear fashion. Uh, then maybe you step back. Maybe you go backwards. Maybe you go in a big freaking circle. It's like a river. So it's the difference between a straight highway that goes from Denver to Cheyenne, <laughs> like in an absolutely, almost absolutely straight line, or I-70 that goes all the way across, almost in a straight line, uh, versus Little Mountain Road that is like switchback, switchback, a little bit of straight, then it turns, and then it turns, and turns, and turns. It's that turn, turn, turn. You can't see what's around the next bend in the road until you've made the turn that we're moving toward. So that, I believe, has a lot to do with why we are feeling like suddenly we can't see down the road. We can't perceive what's coming because the road is twisting and turning so quickly. We have to sit back, anchor in our bodies, start to build a partnership with a body we abandoned probably when we were little kids for most of us. And sit back and enjoy the ride. The mind is meant to travel. The body does the driving. Have you ever been on a, a journey where you weren't the driver and you just were enjoying kicking back and watching the watching the scenery go by and thinking about things and contemplating the meaning of life and you know wondering where the next love's truck stop was so you could you know get a snack, <laughs> go pee. That's what the mind's job is to do. Learn, observe, receive insight, receive inspiration, contemplate, be curious, try on all the things, but not to take action in, the, in 3D reality with any of that, unless the body says so. Okay, so weird time. The other thing is, for a lot of us, is all of a sudden, the things we used to do, the things that gave our life meaning, the things that drove our sense of purpose, are suddenly over. That's something that she and I are going through at the exact same time, which is interesting. All of a sudden, it's over. I told, I had a reading an astrology reading with Virginia Rosenberg, who I highly recommend, virginiarosenberg.com. You can find her on Instagram, too. Um, she's the resident astrologer for the Koya group, Q-O-Y-A. I have had um, two or three clients really enjoyed her work, and I followed her on social media for a long time. So anyway, I finally got a reading, and I felt like 
I'd been given a get out of jail free card. You know, the card from the Monopoly game that has a little guy. <laughs> it's got a little uh, bird cage or a. Is it a bird cage? It's a little, got a little cage, and the door is swung open, and the little Monopoly guy's like pew running out of it. It's you get a, there's an orange one and a yellow one, and you get the get out of jail free card, and you get to keep it so that <laughs> if you get sent to jail when you're playing the game Monopoly, you can throw your card down and you can continue on your way. I felt like she had handed me that this heavy lifting work this cycle of survival and abuse, uh, the, the deep shadow trauma addiction work I've done with people forever, forever. I don't have to do it anymore. And then I was like, well, I knew I didn't want to do it anymore. I know I've been moving toward groups moving toward thinking about speaking, loving my podcast. But I didn't know that this is the conditioned response, right? So conditioned responses are the things that you do because you think you have to, that you don't have a choice. A conditioned response or a limiting belief, whatever you want to call it, really locks us into this or that, black or white, a yes or no. Like, it, 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 it's hard to see how else could I be working in the world and not do this down-in-the-trenches emergency medicine, slipping on blood kind of work that I've done forever. She was talking to me about service as um, servitude, which, by the way, in my coaching with Steph Lagana, I had uncovered that, that if I received money for my services, then I felt like I had no options then, that I was sort of on the hook, some deep obligation to do something that I couldn't define, right? Because our limiting beliefs are, what? irrational they don't make a damn bit of sense (laughs) that's why that's why they're always tripping us up because they don't make sense and they're incorrect so i had found that and it was like for a lot of people when you say you you're set you're not setting boundaries with your kids and they're ruining your life these are adult children they need to make their mistakes You need to stop, you know, it's impacting your health and your well-being, and you've got to set boundaries with your kids. And they'll say, a lot of people will say, or your spouse or whatever, I can't because it feels wrong. It feels like I'm doing something bad if I set a boundary. It feels like I'm not allowed to say, hey, you know what? I don't want to work like this anymore. It's just, it used to be fun and fine, and now it's like, yeah, I don't want to do it. But what we're moving into is, I don't want to do this, is enough. You don't have to explain it. You don't have to justify it. You don't have to adapt to circumstances that just don't feel good anymore. Maybe something happened, the situation changed, and now you don't want to be a part of it. Or maybe nothing definable happened, it just is energy's diverging and it's not a good fit anymore that's good enough moving to a culture of well-being manifesting money through your time and dedication to your own well-being a lot of clients come to therapy seeking permission That yes, it's okay for you to have a preference. It's okay for you to say, I don't want to get a phone call in the middle of the night that my kid is in jail and get up and and feel like I have to go save them again. I used to work with, you guys know, unless you're new to the podcast, I spent a lot of years working in addiction. Addictive families of addicts suffer terribly. 
They suffer in different ways than the person who has the addiction, but it is a suffering like you wouldn't believe unless you've been there. It's hard and painful. And the process is learning how you love people, how you serve people, and also serve yourself primary. It's not selfishness. We, we, Heather and I talked a lot of today about this concept of a more impersonal love. Virginia used the word a different kind of maturity. It's really giving people the ultimate freedom, the people around you and yourself, the ultimate compassionate freedom to make your own mistakes, air quote mistakes to stumble and fall and pick yourself up while being loved. So this isn't cold. And this, you know, um, Byron, Katie, whatever, she's like everybody else, got her pluses and minuses. But a lot of times people will say the work, the method called the work is cold and impersonal. And it's not. When you really do it, when you talk to her in person, it's the most loving energy out there. It's really impossible to describe what it's like to talk to her and touch, hold her hand. Um, it, it blew me away when I met her. Um, it's an incredible love, but it's the kind of love that is not going to interfere with your journey through life at all. That is service, not servitude. That's a love that says, I'm going to stand here and surround you with love while you trip and fall and skin your knee and get up and get a Band-Aid and pat yourself up and, and keep going. I hope this is coming across correctly. It's an impersonal love. However, when you've always loved, when you've been trained to love as servitude, as caretaking, as you have to carry the burden because if you don't, something terrible is going to happen. This happens to a lot of fives and sixes. In If your profile lines in human design, if you have your human design chart, if you don't have it, you can get one at freehumandesignchart.com. Pretty simple. Your profile lines is a combination of two numbers, one through six. If you've got a five or a six, a lot of times, or a three, um, a lot of times you had to grow up too fast and you had to pick up the burden for the family, or you thought you did. Pick up the burden for the family. Be the fixer, the caretaker, the one who does the heavy lifting, becomes a parent to younger kids, becomes an adult way too soon for whatever reason. Um then you're conditioned that your value is based on how hard you're working for everybody else. This is why it's so hard to let go of codependent patterns because you feel if you let people fall, you're doing something bad, you're going to get in trouble, they can't live without you. If you let them fall, then they won't be able to pick themselves back up, so you have to intervene. And that's not true. When I was unwinding codependent patterns as a teenager, things that I thought made sense. I had an aunt in a very, very violent relationship. And at the time, I didn't understand the dynamics of that at all. So I was always like intervening and trying to save her and rescue her. And she wasn't ready for that then. It, 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 the dynamics are complicated. I'm not going to go into that. But until somebody's ready for your work, you're spinning your wheels and you're depleting yourself, which doesn't serve anybody, that is service as servitude. The thing about human design is just because, I say this all the time, just because you see it, 
Just because you see someone struggling, just because you see someone struggling and you can immediately tell, see, especially if you're a projector and you see deeply into people, you can very quickly see why they're struggling. And our tendency is to jump in and fix it or tell them how to fix it. I don't know which one is worse. (laughs) Telling people how to fix their problem when you haven't been asked or invited or um, actually intervening and saving them so they don't get the opportunity to grow. We have to stop and ask ourselves, okay, I see this person struggling. They are asking for help, but Judging by the comments, they're not actually available yet for help. Should I intervene or not? Should I comment or not? M- most of the time, you're, you're going to get no. No. Your input is not needed just because you can see the problem. Just because you know how to fix it doesn't mean you should fix it. When you've lived your whole life like that and you suddenly get the get out of jail free card, (laughs) you don't get that card unless you're already ready and available to drop it all. It's like, well, now what? Now I've been asking myself the now what question for about a year. I'm going to say since about mid-January. Well, now what do I do? I know I don't want to do this. Now what? I'm used to this heavy work. What does light work even look like? I'm used to slapping duct tape on stuff just to make things work and not caring what they look like. And all of a sudden, I'm craving beautiful handbags. (laughs) I'm craving beautiful clothes. Like right now I'm the kind of person or have been the kind of person I'm actually wearing them right now. Uh, I will wear clothes around the house till they literally dissolve because <laughs> I don't care. I've in my head, I've been doing my work. I'm always heavy lifting, I'm always learning. I don't really give a crap what I'm wearing. And then suddenly it's like, wait a minute, I'm wearing yoga pants that have had a hole in them for six months. And they're like becoming paper thin. (laughs) And I'm noticing that and thinking, God, forever I have chosen uh, function over form. And now I'm craving form, beautiful things, soft things. Things that work, but also look beautiful. So that's some North Node, South Node stuff that human design covers and astrology covers. And I'm not going to go into that. But what I, uh, and then so Heather's going through the same thing. A big sudden gear shift may have you feeling like the ground just fell out from under you. And you don't really know what to do with yourself. This can happen to people in midlife, but I, I'm hearing that this is happening to people just a lot across the board because our entire world is turned upside down, right? And when that happens, we're forced to um, reevaluate. Oh, this is how I've always done things, and now I can't. Now what? Could probably title the podcast now. Now what the fuck? Now what the fuck do we do? We've always done this. I've always stood here. And now I need to take a step back and amplify black voices. Where do I stand now? I want to do this well. Where do I... If I've always done this heavy, intense work... And I want to still serve, but I want to serve in the interest of beauty and embodiment and enjoying your physical body and feeding yourself wonderful things and adorning your body with beautiful jewelry and clothing. Where do I stand? 
How does that look? So I just want you to know that if you're going through that, it's really important to let that empty space be there. Our tendency, nature abhors a vacuum, correct? Say yes. <laughs> yes, Michelle, nature does abhor a vacuum. We've all gotten at least one fortune cookie that says that. Nature abhors a vacuum, but it's... It behooves us, it serves us, and the people we serve, the people we love, the people we interact with, it serves us better to let that space be open. Don't try to fill it too soon. If you try to fill it too soon, you're going to fill it with the familiar. The, sh- the, sh- the the um, the shape of it may change, but the energy will be the same if you fill it too soon. This is the same thing that happens to addicts when all of a sudden they go to jail or they're hospitalized and they cannot use their drug of choice. They don't know what to do with themselves because now all the stuff that was smothered by that is there up in their face raging without skills it's unbearable so of course they get out of rehab and go straight for the thing that will turn the volume down we'll do the same thing if you've always done a job and you've viewed it as your mission in life and you've really used it as your sense of purpose. And you're getting the message to stop doing that work. Or you've been downsized or fired or your jo- you, know, you, do- you can't work right now because of the virus. You may f- feel that sense of being unmoored. Suddenly cut loose in your little boat from the dock with no oars. And no knowledge of how to use a sailboat. How, how does one use a sailboat? I don't know. But if you stay present with your boat, if you let yourself drift, if you let yourself dream, lay down in the floor of the boat and start daydreaming. Your heart will start to enter your consciousness. The voice of your body, the voice of your heart, the voice of your soul will have room to begin to talk to you, to take your eyes to things in your environment that have meaning to you, to help you see signs and synchronicities that will lead you automatically to the path that you're going to walk now, to this new place of where you will stand. If you stay in beginner's mind, stay in the curiosity, and deal with the discomfort of, holy shit, I don't know what to do with myself. I used to get up every day and do this stuff and think about this stuff and plan for this stuff and do this kind of work. And now all of a sudden, I know I'm not supposed to do that anymore. But the new thing isn't here yet. For me, it is. Like, I know exactly. I I don't know what the form will be, but I've got the energy signature of it now. Thank goodness. Because I was a little like, what the fuck? (laughs) What the fuck? What do I do? Like, I was starting to worry. Like, am I getting depressed? Am I losing my mind? Because I don't know what to do. And I'm sleeping a lot. And I'm drifting. And I have things on my task list that I'm not doing. It's not that I don't want to do them. I don't know how to do them now. I don't know where I stand. So if you're feeling that... It's okay. It's a normal thing that's happening to a lot of people who are very aware that things are changing and they're, this earth energy is splitting. People have been saying that for a long time and I have felt it and I know that a lot of you have too. There are two paths diverging in a wood 
And we have to pick which one we're going to walk on. But how we walk on that may look radically different to anything we've ever done. Or it may not change at all, but the energy of it will be completely different. I'll still do human design, but how that looks is going to be very different. My, I'm still moving into doing websites. I'm really thinking websites for artists, where I get to be a part of bringing their beauty to the world with a beautiful, functional website. There's all kinds of options. So know that if you feel a drift, that the things that used to motivate you are gone. Um, Heather said today, the when when we stop being motivated by shame, I'm paraphrasing, of course, when we stop being motivated by shame, meaning that we keep rescuing people, we keep not setting boundaries, we keep doing heavy lifting work when we're so exhausted and done with that. Because we think if we don't, we're bad people, that's a shame motivation. So what are we going to be motivated by now? What's going to motivate you now to get up? To do some things in the world? To interact with your fellow human beings, preferably from a distance and with a mask on? <laughs> okay, we have to pick which way we're going. If you knew that it didn't matter what you did, there's a podcast on here from a few months ago, so it might be way down the list, um, but the title is, You Don't Have a Purpose. What if you don't have a purpose? It really doesn't matter. What if you're doing what lights you up is more than enough? What if... The things you enjoy doing don't have to be monetized. This happens to artists a lot. Oh, you should sell that. You should have an Etsy shop. Well, maybe you should, maybe you shouldn't, but your body is the one to make that decision. Not your head and not the people around you. So we have to find our intrinsic value. So this is a lot about the will center on the chart, the heart, ego, will. It governs money and material resources. And that center, if it's open, works really hard to for acknowledgement of their value. Like they live for their performance review, and it better be all fives. <laughs> like they're working really hard and they want recognition because then they feel valuable. And the trick is, and that's most of us, by the way, it's... it's um. A, a small percentage of people that have that center defined. We have to re-explore what makes you feel valuable. What makes you feel like you're a contributing member of society? What makes you feel like you're doing a good job? And then what happens if you're the only one that gets to decide that? Not your paycheck, not your performance review, not the number of clients you have or don't have, not the number of likes, not the number of website visitors. What if nothing outside of you gets to define how you feel about your value? What if you experiencing pleasure and following your body's lead is enough? The answers will come. For some of you, that means marching in the streets and putting a jug of milk in your bag. So if you get tear gassed, you can help yourself. For some of you, that means you're going to read a lot and you're going to donate and you're going to examine yourself for where your internalized white supremacy privilege lives. For some of you, it may be none of that. I don't know. You know where I stand on that. So keep that in mind. (laughs) 
okay. For some of you, you might leave the corporate world you've always been in and go be a hippie on the beach and just say, fuck it, I'm going to be homeless. <laughs> Whatever. I mean, it's like, like, that's the extreme end of it, but it could happen. It's happened to other people where they just say, screw it, I'm going to go be a beach bum. Let the space be there so that what's next for you can fill it. It will fill it, so you'll have to work on trust. You'll have to undo the conditioning in your in your will center that says you have to work like a dog to make money, or you have to always be at everybody's beck and call, or you're not valuable, you're not a good person. You have to notice when you're doing stuff because you're going to feel like a shithead if you don't. That is exactly the wrong reason to take an action. Someone calls you for the 500th time and wants you to drop everything and take them to an appointment. And you do it because you're going to feel bad if you don't. That's the kind of shit that has to stop. If you want to make money through well-being, you can't always... Be violating your integrity. If you tell yourself, I'm not going to let this happen to me anymore, but you keep letting it happen, you're breaking a promise to yourself, and the will center governs self-integrity and promises as well. So integrity is a piece of that. There's a bunch here, right? There's a lot. So when an addict is suddenly cut off... They, if they have access to a replacement drug, they'll do that. So some addicts will go from heroin to alcohol or um, heroin or uh, like um, alcohol to marijuana or other directions. Like they'll just find a replacement. If somebody forces themselves to restrict food and doesn't give them any doesn't give themselves a source of pleasure from something else, they'll white knuckle it for a while and then end up head first in a bag of twink uh, ding dongs, twinkies, whatever whatever your food drug of choice is. So the space is there of whatever is ending. Observe it, feel the discomfort, feel, breathe into this loose, you know, at loose ends feeling and not being able to relax. If you have an open root center, that may be a bigger challenge for you. Like you got to find ways to give yourself permission to relax, to give yourself permission to not know what to do. And not just cram any dumb thing in that energetic space so that you don't have to feel the discomfort. When if you wait, something wonderful will come to you. Your next step will be made clear. You won't miss it if you're listening. Reconnecting to your value. Simply by being here, you have value. I was talking to her about my cats today, and I'm watching the cats. I'm watching the wildlife. The wildlife gets up. They move around. They play. They take a bath. They take a nap. They sleep through the afternoon. They wake up in the evening. They eat, play, have sex, whatever. Like, they're running around. They're doing stuff. Or they're napping. You know, there's a rhythm. But we don't look at our pets and say, you don't have any value because you don't have any investments. Let me see your stock portfolio, Tonka. Oh, you don't have one? Well, you're worthless. What? What's your purpose in life? Taking up space and eating frisky treats. Is that it? <laughs> what if that is it? We let it be good enough for them because we haven't told them that they have to get a job and earn their keep. Now, horses and, you know, animals, beasts of burden, they have a different experience. They don't get to do their own thing. Maybe that's a good metaphor to um, explore on a different day. But, 
You know what I mean? Like their value is in, for us, their value is in the joy they bring us. We love our pets. I love them. They're a pain in the butt and they make it hard to travel. And there's too many of them. But I love them. They don't do anything. They take up space and eat frisky treats and shed hair everywhere. <laughs> but what if that was enough? What if you, being you, and exploring your desires and your joy and, and feeding yourself nothing but the best and, you know, buying the best clothing you can possibly afford, even if you only have two outfits, but they're the best quality. What if that's enough? What if you smiling and doing the work that feels good to you is enough? And sometimes we have bills to pay and in transition, we have to pick up a junk job or whatever just to keep going while we're exploring. So I'm not saying that. I'm not saying go be a beach bum unless you really feel like that's your path. It's a hard life. Okay. So shifting from struggle and work your ass off to exploring joy, getting in partnership with your body, and allowing things to be delivered to you on a silver platter. This happens to my human design clients all the time when they settle down. So if you feel lost... If you feel unmoored, if you feel like you have no idea what the hell you're supposed to do now, if you feel like you're losing your mind, if you feel like you have uh, slipped into some weird funhouse mirror time zone, it's all okay. It's all normal. Just keep day by day. This is a practice that I call extreme mindfulness, moment-by-moment mindfulness. You might not be able to allow yourself to think as far ahead as, what the fuck am I going to make for dinner? What am I going to feed my kids tonight? I don't even know, and just the thought of trying to figure out what to fix is overwhelming. Okay, so don't think that far. What are you doing right this minute? Put your hands on your hands. Hold your own hand. Look at your hand. Examine your fingernails. That's extreme mindfulness. Pay attention to your breath. What are my feet doing? What is in? What are my feet touching? Are my feet on the bed or on the floor? What does feeling the floor with my feet feel like? Extreme mindfulness, moment by moment. So, there's so much more. I think that I will just have um, Heather join me for a, a podcast where we can just free flow this stuff out and see what's helpful for you. Um, the question of what to do next will answer itself. You don't have to reach out. It will come to you in response to the love that you are practicing giving yourself, the nourishment that you are giving your body, the coming home to your body. Everything starts to take care of itself. Okay, and if that feels weird, this is all fine. It's all normal. It's normal for our abnormal times. <laughs> Let's say it that way. It doesn't feel very normal. Well, because it's new, we don't know how not to work so hard. We don't know what life looks like when we focus on extreme self-care and then we do the work that's presented to us to do. We don't know that world, but that's the world we're moving into. So you better get used to it and let yourself have the space for your next step to show up, okay? All right, in the meantime, think less, feel more. I'll talk to you next time.